know, you've heard about addiction and you've heard about drug abuse. I think both of those things are important because they're both very dangerous things right now. It's very dangerous to be a drug addict and it's very dangerous to be a drug abuser. Um, in the past, you know, you've heard the numbers, but I can tell you just practically on a, on a concrete level. Uh, the past year and a half for me personally, I've been to more funerals than I've been in the 12 previous years that I'm running the living room, uh, which is, like Sue said, is a community and a clubhouse for young adults in recovery. Um, so, this is a serious topic, and uh, it's a great honor to talk about it. So, uh, invariably what happens when I do an event like this, if my, if my, particularly if my name's on some kind of flyer or something, a friend will come over to me in shul, and he'll tell me about some strange addiction that he has. Uh, there's, a, there's a television show I heard on, on, on TV about people's strange addictions, but uh, I, get, I get a whole, a whole lot of them. So my friend came over to me the other day, I was in shul on Friday, and he came over to me and he told me about his addiction to traveling. And he wanted to know if it was a problem. So, uh, so, uh, so I, we got to talking about it a little bit. And, uh, and uh, you know, I started to ask him things like, okay, what, what, what is it that you like about traveling? You know? And he says, well, you know, I, I come up to the, uh, he works for a large corporation, so he has like a, a high status on the airline. So he says, I pull up to the curb, and the guy comes and takes my bag, and they usher me through the airport. And, uh, and then I go right through the check, the uh, security check, and I go right up, to, and I go to this fancy uh, place, the first class lounge, and they give me drinks, and I feel important. And I think I'm addicted to that. So I, so I said, yeah, that's, that's kind of what you're addicted to. You know, you finally someone about, you know, acknowledge that you're valuable, you know, and, uh, you know, and he let him a lot, you know, and we talked a little bit about how, about how that really occurs in a very significant way in the life of all addicts, you know, because the truth is, I heard a wise man once say that addicts are just like everybody else except more. All the stuff that we do, they do except at an extreme. So, uh, you know, and, and one of the things we talked about was that, um, you can get so trapped in the thought, you know, that the only way that he was ever going to feel important enough in his life was if he traveled with that concierge status on the, on, on the airplane. You know, and, and to be trapped in that dependency, that I could, my, my self-value is reliant upon that. And the human tendency to get trapped in those things. And really, in a lot of ways, that's really what we see with addicts. They're really people that are suffering. People that are dr abusing drugs also, they are having fun. They are, they are trying to have a good time to experience euphoria. But they're also going through a lot of pain, and uh, and they're trying to find a way to feel okay. And, uh, and we need to consider that, especially when we're considering how to take action to try to rectify the issue and save their lives. So, so you had asked me to talk about hope, and uh, you kind of ask yourself, why would you want to talk about hope? You know, do I want to like make everybody feel better? So he just gave us a very heart wrenching speech about how serious this is, and we need to get our acts together, and we need to take action. And that's true both in this community, I know in Queens, but also in Five Towns, and Brooklyn, and Muncie, and Lakewood, and every, every you know, <clears throat> from community all over. So why talk about hope? Is that going to lead people to complacency? So I want to give you a sense of why we should talk about hope. Why hope is a very important topic when you're talking about combating drug, drug addiction, when you're talking about combating overdoses, drug abuse, etc. So when you're engaging a problem, so to answer that question, why hope is important, I'll give you another question. Because I'm a good Jew, so that's what we do. So when you're engaging a problem, there's really two ways that you can approach the problem. You can approach the problem with a problem-centric perspective, or you can approach the problem with a solution-centric perspective. And I want to talk about the difference between those two things. So a problem-centric perspective is that I have a problem. I show up and I have a problem. My human nature tells me, I need to get rid of this problem. I need to get rid of the problem, so what am I going to do? Something's wrong, I have to fix it. Let me figure out where it came from. Let me eradicate the problem and make sure it doesn't exist ever again. Now, that makes sense. It's a logical thing to do. If I have a problem, I want to get rid of it. But there's a few problems with that, particularly when it comes to addiction. Because that kind of perspective, many times, is the result of and the cause of denial. Which means that I think that just because I decided that the problem should go away, it's going to go away. I think that just because I'm going to police the problem, it's going to disappear. And I think that just because I say that it's unacceptable, it doesn't exist. And that's the kind of tendency that we have to fall into. So we have to, we have to guard against that. So what do we do? What do we do? We have a problem. I want to fix it. What do we do? So one of the things I thought about talking about tonight is, uh, you know, she mentioned um, AA meetings and any meetings. Is a, two of the larger 12-step 
uh, fellowships that exist in this country. You have some information, I think, on the, uh, on the table over there about Narcotics Anonymous MA. And there's many 12-step fellowships. And uh, the 12 steps have been, have been around for 80 plus years, and they've mystified everybody around them at their effectiveness, their ability to help people. They are one of the most effective tools in helping people that are addicts achieve abstinence, achieve uh, the, um, being clean and sober, and, and, uh, and living clean and sober. So there's a lot we can learn from them. And this is not meant to be like a uh, commercial for the 12 steps, that's not my intention. But, but without a doubt, if we talk about effective models of recovery, they are some of the most effective models of recovery. Now the novelty in the 12 steps, people sometimes look at the 12 steps. Well, sometimes people have resistance to the 12 steps. When then they take a look at it, you look at the 12 steps and you find that their wisdom is not new. The wisdom is very old. We're very familiar with their wisdom. It's very, it's very familiar to us. It's, it's ancient wisdom. It's logical wisdom. It makes sense. It's common sense. But the real novelty in the 12 steps is in their order. It's in the order in which they take at combating the problem. And I thought it'd be important, or maybe interesting, for us to just take a minute to just kind of consider how they go about approaching the problem. And maybe it would kind of shift our perspective a little bit on how we walk out of here, kind of what we do when we walk out of here. So what the steps do is they begin with the obvious. They begin with an admission, admission of the problem. Right? Now, you assume that kind of sounds a lot like the problem-centric perspective that I talked about a minute ago. Okay, I, I acknowledge there's a problem, and now I'm going to move on. But really what they do is they do something very, very interesting. They say, no, 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 it's not enough to just acknowledge the problem. You, admit to, you need to admit the problem to yourself. You need to admit the problem to your innermost self, is the language that they use. I mean, you need, to, you need to accept the problem as it is, and, and as it will be. Meaning that I have a problem that's not going to disappear. It's not just going to go away because I will it to go away. It's not going to go away because I decide not to have it. It's here, and I need to learn how to deal with it and combat it. So you think, okay, let's get to the problem. What's the source? What's the root? Maybe it's uh, abuse, neglect, emotional problems. Let me get to the problem. But that's not what they do. Interestingly, this is the novelty in them. They say, no, no, no. First you need to do is you need to spend some time developing some hope that a life free of the problem is possible. Now, why is this important? Why should I develop hope that a life free of the problem is possible? What do I mean? If I just get rid of all the drugs, people will stop dying. But that's not true. It doesn't work. So how can I develop a hope that, the, why should I develop a hope that, the, that, that a, a life free of the problem is, is possible? Because whatever I take now, whatever action I take at this point, whatever I action I take when I acknowledge the fact that I can live free of this problem, won't just try to be managing and containing the problem, policing the problem, but rather it will inspire me to take action to gain freedom from it, to gain freedom from its grips, and learn how to live with this problem. And I don't just mean for addicts, by the way. Everything I'm talking about now is not to talk to, to the addicts that are in the room. I'm sure there's a number of them. If you look at statistics, it's probably 15 or 20 of you in the room. And, uh, but, but I'm talking to everybody. Because as a community, one of the interesting things that occurs, one of the interesting things that occurs with addiction is that it affects everybody around them. And everybody starts thinking and talking like an addict. So when we go, when Sweets talks about sitting down with a group of principals who refuse to acknowledge the problem, it's because they are suffering from the same disorder that the addicts are suffering from. They suffer from a deep sense of denial. That if they stick their head in the sands, the problem doesn't exist. So we need to look at that. We need to look at that as a community. Okay, so what do I do now? Okay, so I have a hope that there's a, that there's a sense, now is it time to act? And they said, no, 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 it's not time to act. First, you need to develop a sense, develop an awareness that there's a power, that there's power outside of you that can help you, that there's great power. And for us as, as observant Jews, you know, we believe that power is Hashem, right? And that Hashem is here, he's going to help us with this problem, that we are facing a Yisayim, a Yisayim, and then we have to face this problem head on, and then we need his help. Now, the interesting thing about it is when you acknowledge that, you, that Hashem is here, and you acknowledge that you need his help, you also acknowledge that he has given you the problem and he wants you to face it. He doesn't want us to continue to, to ignore the problem. He wants us to face it head on with his help. So now, now if you've done that, you've acknowledged the problem, acknowledged as it is, and you have a sense that there's an opportunity to live outside of this problem, that we can overcome this problem and live outside of it, and a sense of meaningfulness and purposefulness, <clears throat> that this is a spiritual action that we have to take as a community to to help the people that need help and eradicate the acuteness of the problem. Not that we can eradicate the problem entirely because it's a human problem, but eradicate the acuteness of it and provide support for the people that need it. Now we're ready to take action, and the actions that you do in the 12 steps is you further diagnose the problem, you remove blockages, and you learn a new way of living. 
and we need to do that just the same. That's the wisdom that we learn. So really, this is the great power of hope. We're readjusting, we it reorients our thinking towards a solution-oriented perspective. We need to come up with a solution. So first, I want to talk about what's happening. So we talked about asked me to talk about some 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 hope. This is what's going on in the last in the last three years since Amudim um, started the work specifically that they're doing. They have referred over 300 people to inpatient treatment. 300 addicts who are formerly suffering, drug abusers are in inpatient treatment, and 350 to outpatient treatment. Now that's not the numbers for the entire New York, that's the numbers just for this specific organization. I'll talk a little bit about the living room. We try not to really, you know, the living room is like it is, uh, operates in a non-distinct building in the middle of Flatbush, we really try to stay off the radar. But I'll give you a little sense of what's going on so you would think that uh, you know, there's this huge problem, but there's really amazing things going on. We have a population living room of over 150 young adults who are in recovery. We have 35 young couples that come. There are some, many of them are people that came to our program, and when they were single after we have, and now have gotten married subsequently and established families. Some are people that have, that have been married for a period of time and, and, and were able to come to a place of acknowledging the problem and now seeking help. And we've been able to, this year, in the last year and a half, we've had to adapt our program to provide a specific program for couples in recovery. We provide a retreat once a year with, uh, with supports and information for them. We're doing something very cool. And this is what I'm very excited about. This is probably the most exciting thing that, that I'm doing. And I, and I want to share it with you because it's, it's inspirational. And, and I get, I, I'm just like a backseat driver for this thing. I had this idea. You know, in Israel, there's a, a fledging English-speaking recovery community. In Jerusalem, you have a lot of people that are either in, in, uh, in yeshiva there for the year, or maybe they're in Kola there for a couple of years, that are actively in recovery. You know, and, and rec the recovery community spans the entire spectrum of the Jewish community. Every level of religiosity, every uh, denomination, every background. And, uh, but one of the things that goes on in that community is that people are there temporarily, because they're there for a year, or two years, or three years, or five years, and then they leave. So the community is relatively fledging. So I had an idea that maybe we could take people from here that are kind of established a life of sobriety, a life of recovery, and we go there to a mission to Israel. But it's very difficult to pay for something like that. So, uh, so my friend Ari came up with a great idea. He came up with a great idea. He said, you know, everyone, everyone a lot, many organizations that utilize the Jerusalem Marathon and they have young people and they raise money to run the Jerusalem Marathon and they get a free trip to Israel. So he said, what if we get the young people from the living room to raise money to run the Jerusalem Marathon and instead of spending the money on their organization, we could spend the money on this mission. So we're doing that, we're leaving on Wednesday, next Wednesday. And uh, 15 young people. And uh, they're taking time off of work. And, and this, is, this, is not, this is not a, uh, a commercial for the organization, it has nothing to do with that. This is 15 young people who were previously as hopeless as Sweet described, who are now getting on a plane, and they're gonna spend four or five days in Israel without one break. They're visiting rehabs, visiting me meetings, going around, encouraging people, because there's hope. There's real hope. If you get, ask for help, you can get help. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to just add one. I wanted to add one more metric, just uh, to to couple with C's metric and, uh, and the doctor's metric. Since Rosh Hashanah, so since September, we had 55 celebrants celebrate their year anniversary at the living room. Meaning, every year, someone in sobriety, someone who's in a 12-step program or not in a 12-step program, they come back, and the year, that, the day that they got sober, they celebrate as a, a second birthday anniversary. So we have 55 celebrants this year. Eight of them celebrated a year, 11 of them celebrated 11, two, I'm sorry, 11 of them celebrated two years, and we had a total of 259 years of sobriety celebrated this year in the living room. And I mention that because there's hope. There's real hope for people that want, that want help. And in the greater Jewish community, there's tons of things going on. There's a lot of hope. There's 10 um, mental health uh, substance abuse institutions that treat specifically the friend community. There's, on top of that, many, many, many rehabs who have made a lot of effort, as a result of efforts by Tzvi and other people in our community to help them become competent, to provide support and treatment for, from people that need, that, need, that need treatment, rehabs, outpatient, inpatient, recovery support programs. There's two new websites that are being, that are being launched just for people in recovery, uh, message boards, uh, support programs. This is not, I mean, to do with these things, but these things are going on. I was so excited to hear about these things. Books are being published. Every year there's two or three books published, either about recovery or people, for people in recovery. The Jewish community is beginning to respond to this issue. Unfortunately, as we've begun to respond, the issue is getting worse. 
It's getting worse and it's getting more dangerous. Our population in my program has doubled and tripled over the last four or five years. And of course, you heard about the, the dangerous deaths that are going on. The awareness about addiction in the community is rising. And the awareness, unfortunately, about the kind of abuse, specifically sexual abuse, that many times is the precursor to a life of drug addiction and uh, drug abuse is, 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 uh, is being found out. But at the end of the day, it's a dangerous place out there. There's dangerous drugs on the street, as Dr. Pascal mentioned. There's a normalization of heavy drug use, like heroin. When I was in high school and in my early years of my career, kids didn't do heroin. I mean, kids that had gone on beyond the level and experienced drug abuse and addiction for many, many years would eventually graduate into heroin. Today, I can tell you very clearly that young adults, particularly, will begin to use drugs. And within six months, a year, they're already using very illicit drugs, cocaine, heroin, dangerous and illicit drugs. This is not, the progression towards dangerous and illicit drugs is quicker than ever. And, and the last thing is people are dying. So what do we do? So what do we do? So I want to share, a, it's not a Shabbos, I want to share a little bit of a, of a Torah thought with you, just, just briefly, and then I, I want to just give some specific uh, comments. And then I'll be done. So I was reading the other day, I was in shul, I was before davening, I was reading through the, uh, the you know, before Shachris, we read the, the episode of Avram Avinu by Akedas Yitzchak. And it says that Hashem challenged, he gave us an Yitzchak, he gave Avram Avinu an Yitzchak. And one of the interesting things that happens is that Hashem gives Avram Avinu this great Yitzchak that he should bring his son Yitzchak Isaac up to as a, as a, as a sacrifice. And, and it describes in detail every step that Avram does along the way. One of the things I noticed is that it doesn't plan. It doesn't say that he planned how he was actually going to do it. And if you look at the, if you look at the, if you look at the way that it's written in the Torah. And I'm not saying this is pshat. Maybe just something that we can think about. It doesn't say that he planned how, because maybe he couldn't imagine doing it. But God had given him an Isaiah, and he said, "Listen, I have to just put one foot in front of the other. I have to put left foot, right foot, right foot, left foot. One foot in front of the other." Even at one point, Yitzchak says to Avram Avinu, he says, "He says, here's, you know." Um, you know, we have all the, all the material necessary. You know, where's the set? And Avram says, Hashem will show us the set. This is a very important thing to think about. This is a very, very important thing to think about. That even though the, the problems seem so numerous, but, and, and we don't know how we're, how we're going to get through it, but at the end of the day, we need to take steps. We need to take steps like this, but more and more steps, each community. We need to acknowledge to ourselves that there is a problem, and that it's not going to disappear just because we decided it's going to. It might never disappear to some degree. We need to develop a culture of compassion for victims of abuse and sufferers. We need to provide community awareness like this and more. You need to share what you hear tonight with your friends who didn't may have the courage or the alacrity to come tonight. We need to develop more resources for those who are ready to get help. Crisis intervention, outreach, support. We need to support the institutions that are doing that. We need to advocate and support culturally competent treatment. There are treatment programs that are providing treatment. It's our responsibility as a community to reach out to those programs, to reach out to those institutions, political institutions, to make sure they understand how to help our community. And that's each individual community with all of its, its little nuances. <coughs> and finally, we need to embrace those who seek help instead of shaming them. Lastly, I'll say, we must accept, I wrote this down because I want to just say it the way I read it. I read it. <laughs> we must accept that Hashem is presenting us with this challenge and we no longer can ignore it or just blame the sufferers or just try to police them. We have to educate ourselves, adapt to the reality, and grow, but even more, even more so mature as a community. <clears throat> May all these efforts be a schluss for the whole Jewish people to bring us closer to Noah from the Gula. Thank you very much.